that is a weather report. <laughs> oh no, StreamYard has lost access to your Twitch account. Mm. Sure, you'll have to fix that. Yeah, I don't know. Something happened, I guess. That okay. password is incorrect. Did someone change the password on my Twitch account? Maybe. Mm -mm. Think hey, you welcome to the Backpack Show. <laughs> Where we talk about success and find insights from unusual places. We have a show for you today. We're going to talk with Tracy Shelton, founder of Alamo Kitchen, which is a shared use commercial kitchen space and incubator designed and developed for food focused entrepreneurs. We're going to talk to her and we're going to talk to now. This is interesting because I had never had an evolutionary scientist on the show before, but we're about to. So we have lots and lots of questions for Professor Randolph Ness, who asked that we just call him Randy which I think is very nice, author of Good Reasons for Bad Feelings. I saw an article talking about how things like depression and anxiety served an evolutionary purpose, and I found that intriguing. So we're going to talk with him today about that. And also, before I forget, congratulations to the New England Patriots. <clears throat> I mean, Tampa Bay Buccaneers <laughs> last night uh, won completely by the Patriots. So I think we got a lot to talk about today. And look, Chloe is back on station. <laughs> Hi everyone, Tim Kitzer from NBA Jam and NFL Blitz, welcoming you to The Backpack Show. Your hosts, Chris Brogan, Terry Gargone, Boom Shakalaka. Backpack Show. Deanna's here. Hey, and Deanna. Nancy. All oh our my Scottish gosh, Nancy folks are coming here. in. So glad to see Nancy. Hey. Uh, what a day, what a day, what a day. Uh, I'm going to try my best to remember to actually do our ads at the beginning. You have to so. do them all. I mean, you could like split them up. I know, I know. We could do them like this too. StreamYard. Okay, that was good. <laughs> okay, that was good. Johnsonville, they seem nice. People don't Pubside. know what Castos is. Yeah, Castos is a podcasting app. Uh, that's why I put P-Pods, C-Pods, podcasting. Oh, Castos.com is a podcasting platform <laughs> that allows you to host your podcast. We now have an audio version of the Backpack Show because so many people kept twisting my arm to do it. And I said, well, fine. I was and not one of those people. Nope. Uh, but I got one. StreamYard, this is how you make a show like this. See brogan.me slash StreamYard. Make your own show, but... It's super easy, but you mm. got to bring your own evolutionary scientist. There you go. Uh, pub site authors, uh, people who write books about feelings, uh, could have their own website super fast and easy. Go to pub-site.com. It is 20 bucks a month. You get 14 days free in the first two hours. You can make your website and then have 13 and a half days to marvel at how beautiful it was. Oh, amazing. We are sponsored uh, absolutely ironically by Johnsonville. If you want sausage, though, Carrie will hook you up. Carrie at chrisbrogan.com. Get you some juicy sausages. And when I misspoke, it's Professor Randolph Nessie. Is it Nessie? Mm -hmm. oh, I right. have been saying it wrong, too. I've been saying Ness. Well, thank well, goodness we got the correction. Yes. That's what we come on the show for, to learn, right? Yes. Oh, I come to every show I go to completely waiting to be filled with knowledge. Like I do, don't pretend to be an expert in evolutionary science or commercial kitchens or cooking at all. Well, I, in fact, purposely became so bad at cooking that nobody would want me to do it because I just don't like it. <laughs> so... Well, now we got to talk to the wizard of cooking. We got to talk to Tracy Shelton. So let's let's learn a little bit about Alamo Kitchens. Hey, Tracy, how the heck are you? Hey, good morning. I'm great. How are you guys? Best ever. Um, so people Best don't ever? understand. You didn't ask her what's cooking. Come on, <laughs> what's you're the king of bad jokes. Cooking? I need oh. a redo. I want to be best ever. <laughs> All right, hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. <clears throat> All right, so we got to bring uh, Tracy Shelton out here from Alamo Kitchens. Hey, Tracy, what's cooking? There you go. <laughs> it's perfect. Do I ever do what's expected? Uh, Tracy, so you don't like you don't have just a plain old restaurant. You don't have drink specials. You don't have uh, you know get some free apps when the game's on kind of a thing. You run a whole different kind of kitchen at Alamo Kitchens. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes, we do. So we are a shared use commercial kitchen space. Um, shared use commercial kitchen space. Shared use commercial kitchen. Warm us up on that one, yeah. What does that all mean, right? We um, when we first started, I. I coined this, um, we were a culinary a co-working space. Mm -hmm. And um, people were like, what the heck is that? But just like folks would go and um, work somewhere else while they were, um, you know, when they were supposed to work from home, this is a space where chefs, caterers, food manufacturers can come in, rent space in our kitchen and prepare their great product to feed all of us. So... We have food manufacturers that are in our space. We've got caterers. We've got meal prep people. We've got beverage makers, salsa makers. They come in. 
they prepare what they, you know, they prepare their wares and they go and they sell it to the public. You I never also thought about it, that before, but isn't I, overhead is part of the problem for a lot of food entrepreneurs. Like it's expensive to have a commercial right. grade kitchen. Absolutely. So that's the whole point, right? Is that we reduce the barrier to entry to getting into the food business, to be able, being able to expand um, in the food business. I am I'm a business coach and I was coaching all these food businesses who had a great product, but they couldn't sell beyond the farmer's market. So here in Texas, we operate under cottage laws. A lot of places do. And at some point, when you're making it out of your home kitchen that's not inspected, you can only sell it directly to people, right? Um, but if you want to get into a grocery store or you want to ship it somewhere, you have to have a commercial kitchen and, and folks just can't afford it. So it's a shared use kitchen where um, we share the cost, right? And it makes it a, an opportunity for folks to get in and, and grow their business. I have two things at once. One is that I, I just have to... I'm so sad I missed your new year with black eyed peas and Oh my gosh. gosh. Let me just say, so we may talk about COVID and pivoting. So one of the things that we had to do in COVID to kind of speed up is we had to bring on some other products and services. We were working to get money to update our website, which we're still hoping to do where the folks could be, um, the folks in our kitchen, we could get catering for them off of the site, right? Mm -hmm. Well, had to accelerate that. So we brought on a resident chef. Her name is Vicky. She is amazing. She owns a company called Crepelandia and she cooks in our kitchen. We brought Vicky on as our resident chef to kind of boost this idea of this is a place to come find people that cook. And she started making these great things. So she said, we did Thanksgiving dinners, we did Christmas dinners and you know, getting the name out there. Yeah, you should come here for catering. Man, then she said, let's do black eyed peas and cornbread for New Year's Eve. Mm. These were, and my mom is listening, and so I apologize, mom, in advance. These are the best black eyed peas I had ever had in my life. <laughs> they were so good. Um, and Can you we say saw, second best for your top mom? Top three? Could you say top yeah. three? Oh, oh, can yeah. we do over? Yeah, mom, <laughs> she she did not mean that, mom. <laughs> they were so she's good. Feeling awkward because she's on film. She slipped and fell. Yeah, I did. They were the oh. second best black eyed peas I've ever had. They were so good. So yeah, you missed it, but we got you. We got mm -hmm. you come next um, next New Year's Eve. So there's a lot to this business. And like you said, because of COVID, because of the way things are changing, there's a lot of ways to look at it. So Chip was talking about this is good for regulatory and all that. There's a whole class of human who has a product that's good enough that all their friends beg them to bring it to every event back when we went to places. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's just say they say all the things that you've you feel good inside your belly, but you don't know, do I, can I really do it? Yeah. One of the things that you could do there is you show them not only just how to, how to make it in the environment that's going to pass legal muster, mm -hmm. but what's it going to take to make 26,000 of something? Do you get into that a bunch? How does that work? Talk about how you coach that. So, right. So we provide coaching to folks that want us to coach them and help them get to the next level because there's one thing to start. And then there's another whole level of when you have to scale up so that you can reach capacity, a capacity that can feed lots and lots of people beyond your friends and family. So that's one of the services that we are now providing to these people in our space and even folks who are just they're foodies or they have some kind of business, even if it's not food, maybe it's um, HHB type products, CPG products, and they want to scale up. It's really just walking them through the process, aligning them with the right resources, um, reviewing what they've got or what they're considering to make sure that it makes sense and it gets them to where they want to go. And also, you know, we one of the ways you succeed, in, in my opinion, is that you have to you have to fail or learn. And so walking them through the learnings, right? So you did this and here was the result. Here's how we could retool and do it better the next time. Because it's so, so key that you have a mentor and someone really looking at it from a, a perspective that's where they're not in it with you, right? Um, they're in it with you, but it's, it's at the end of the day, it's yours. And so they have an objective opinion. And that's what we provide through our coaching for folks. Tracy, you said many letters there when you were talking about different types of foods and products. Can you Sorry. explain them? <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. You said Where? CPG, consumer packaged goods. Consumer. And then you said the other one that I hey, read. Totally I asked wrong. her, did I ask you? I'm just <laughs> given the one that I heard. Let the woman speak. Uh -oh. so I don't know which ones I'm talking about. Consumer packaged goods, CPG. 
Um, Something with an H. HHB, okay. uh, home health beauty. So okay. folks that would do lotions and soaps, that would be home health and, and beauty. Um, and folks that even people who do, um, we have a great a lady in our space who makes the most amazing uh, caramel toffee popcorn and, um, and this, oh my gosh, fudge. Great, right? So just, but walking them through, this tastes really good, but let's look at your label and let's make sure that this label is going to pass a state in inspection or if it has to go through the FDA, what does a federal inspection look like to make sure that you have the nutrients on there, you have the um, the ingredients, right? That it's labeled correctly and you can send it out. So those are those become the little things that people get tripped up on, right? So I know how to make my grandma's famous fill in the blank, but getting it from the pan to someone else's mouth, that becomes a challenge. And what are all the pieces that you, all the I's you need to dot um, along the way, that's the other way that we help. So we provide you the space to cook it, and then we provide you some support and expertise as you get ready to move that from the kitchen into the mouths of- Remember, your mom's watching. <laughs> right. <laughs> Say it. Let's well, mom, well, mom is great. <laughs> Pretzel rolls, gotta love them. Hey, oh, those are great. Where are they? Where Pretzel are they? sandwiches. Oh my gosh, yes. So one of the things that you and I talked about for a second backstage was ghost kitchens, and it's another one of those things that people don't exactly know about. But there's this new kind of mode out there where a, a place will set up a, a, a place for people to cook. And it'll be five restaurants hidden into one so that a place like a DoorDash or an Uber Eats can come and get your Applebee's and your Red Robin. I always, I almost always hear them as those like middling family casual kind of places. It's not like quality per se. Um, do you do anything with that? Or is that part of what you, how do you foresee that fitting into the landscape of what, you know, how we're going to eat? What's your vote on it? I think it's it's here to stay and it's going to be more prominent. It really, really is. And one of the things that we're doing in our space is trying to figure out how to help our clients leverage that ghost kitchen concept, right? They're in the kitchen anyway. They're cooking um, in our space. The problem becomes the consistency of the orders, right? So if you're open all day, are you going to make enough money that it makes sense for you to be rent renting kitchen space. And so for us, it becomes, you know, maybe we do something collaborative for those folks who have a product that we can sell for them through the kitchen. So maybe the kitchen, the ghost kitchen is our ghost kitchen is open all day. And you have a variety of things that you can choose from depending on the time of day that you're ordering or the day of the week that you're ordering. Um, so the, the struggle for a really small entrepreneur that's not a Chili's or an Applebee's with lots and lots of capital is really just how to use, how do you scale um, and how do you afford it? Um, when, you, when you're not really sure when people are going to order and if they're going to order enough to cover your overhead. Do you have one, Carrie? Yes, I was going to. Well, I was like, wait, you were unmuting and stuff. So I was like expecting something really good. I was giving you a second. Um, I was curious about what do you do to make the foods shelf stable like for a little bit and fresh? Like, do you try to get them straight to the end user as quickly as possible? Or like, is there sometimes an inevitable delay and you have to make sure that these foods that normally would go straight to the plate in your home kitchen can last for like just a little bit longer? Yes, is the answer to that. And if my daughter, if my children were behind me, they would say time temperature control, time temperature control, <laughs> because that's the thing, right? I grew up, I'm from Texas and we, food is a big thing in our family. It's a way that we um, share life, right? We would gather around the kitchen and rarely where we sit at a table, it was really in the kitchen and we would watch my mother and my aunts and my grandmother cook and then we'd all kind of eat together. Um, and we, one of the things that happened all the time in my family is we would prepare this food and it would sit out like all day long, right? And we would kind of graze on it. And now knowing what I know, I'm like, holy smokes, Batman, that is so wrong. My mother would say, no one ever got sick, it's fine. But when you're doing this, 
commercially, you really want to make sure that you that you're keeping people safe. Right. And so that means that we're we're regulating the temperature, we're regulating how long it's out. And so because we're cooking it in the kitchen and then taking it somewhere else, we are looking at does it need a warming tray? Does it need a warming box? Does it need a cooling tray? And and our folks get they get done and they go right to delivery most times. Um, if it's a cater job, if it's something that's packaged, it's how do we seal it so that you know we seal it and um, it's in a, a safe a stay safe seal right or it's jarred and um, because we have to make sure that everything coming out of the kitchen is as fresh as it can be and as safe as possible. All right. Well, Carrie, you're going to ask that question because I like that question, but I have one more question, which is yeah. in restaurant touring, uh, there's all this stuff that's, that's out the window, right? I say this about uh, grocery as well, is that, for instance, when you make a menu, the thing that's in the box in the menu is the thing where there's the most uh, margin. So for instance, if something costs you six bucks to make, you put that as you know a very important special at $14 in the margin uh, in the little red box because that's what draws people eyes. And we don't want to guess, and there's so many things on the menu, we go, oh, this, I'll have this thing in a box because it's right. in a box, it must be good. Can't do that in, in this new mode. There's all these new things that like, the way we market food has changed and all that. Mm -hmm. Has that crept into what you're teaching? And, and what do you, how do you address that? Yes, because one of the, there are lots of things that make a business fail, right? And we could, that's a whole nother show. But when you're in a restaurant, you really want to control your labor and your food cost. Those are the biggest, those are the biggest costs that you have. And so you really don't want your food costs to be more than 30%. Um, and, and one of the things that I want to say to folks is, you know, you, you go to XYZ place and it's like French fries for a dollar, right? Mm, okay. But when it's a, they have more capital, they have, right. They have more resources. They can use it as a loss leader and that's fine. With the small entrepreneur, you can't sell French fries for a dollar because, you know, it maybe cost you 30 cents in potatoes and 30 cents in labor and, you know, 20 cents in delivery. Then you lose, you start to lose that margin. So I want to, I'm going to answer your question, Chris, I promise. But I want to encourage people to shop local and small. And when a small business, particularly a restaurant, tells you that you need to pay or ask you to pay 10 bucks for it, give them the 10 bucks because there's layers upon layers upon layers of cost to get that to you. And the margin is really, really slim. Um, and so as a, you know, when we think about cost, it is, it's a 30% um, is what you want to control to try to control your food costs. The higher the quality of the food that you're giving, the higher the quality of the meat and the vegetables, it's going to cost you more. But one of the things that we teach folks is let's try to have some of the same ingredients. So control your menu such that you're using the same ingredients or many of the, of similar ingredients. So then that you're maximizing your food costs and you're reducing your waste. Cause that's the other part, right? Is if I have too many things on the menu with, you know, a beef and a lamb and a turkey and a, if I got all these pieces and I don't sell enough, then I have this food cost that, in that food waste that also affects your bottom line. So did that answer your question or did I just rail about? <laughs> you know, I, I kept thinking about back when we used to be allowed to travel, um, you know, having a multiple pieces that could make many outfits, like just a few things you could wear different ways. That's what that made me think of. But I have a question. What of all the things your mom cooks is your favorite? Okay, so what does my mom cook? That's my favorite. You I have more like, than one favorite. That's okay. Yeah. So my mom makes a really great, probably my favorite thing for my mom is her broccoli and rice casserole. Mm. It's so good. It's she and I really like veg, green vegetables. And my brother really likes the cheese, right? So she chunks it full of both so that everyone's happy. Um, and it's creamy and it's, it's, she made some yesterday, as a matter of fact, and it just, it, it feels like home and um, it feels like mom. Well, I'm yeah. a dessert person. What do we got for dessert? What's on for the menu? For dessert, chocolate cake. 
Mm. Yes. No, oh, no. Yeah, chocolate cake. Mm -hmm. She did not make that yesterday. Mother, you could make me a chocolate cake. If you loved her. <laughs> if you love it. <laughs> We all know food means love. So if there's no chocolate cake, we can talk about that. Where's the love? That's right. <laughs> uh, Tracy Shelton, it's been great. If you could stick around, please do. We've got a little bit of a uh, panel that we'll drag you into a little bit later on. But thank you so much for coming on and sharing some of that cooking goodness with us. Thank you. Remember, we don't have any ads, so we're going right Almost to makes me sad that I can't cook. <laughs> Almost. Almost. Or they but choose not to. Cooking classes coming in 2021. You can get it. No, that won't help me because I don't want to. It's not going to make me like it anymore. Now, from someone who helps people navigate their way through the kitchens to a not, not only a physician, but a founder of a field of medicine, you know, because why be basic and just know somebody who's a doctor? They can found things. Dr. Randy. <laughs> Carrie was not expecting broccoli as a best food answer. Hey, I doctor, how the heck are you? That is true. Nice to see you guys. Good to connect. So Professor uh, Nessie. That's Sorry. it. You got it. Yep. I had that so wrong. So your website sure is uh, professional. Uh, it looks like a very, it looks like a very uh, physician-y website. Like, is that... Physician-y? Well, well, you know, That's I have a question a related to this. I do. Oh. I have a question related to okay. this. It, are there... Are there boundaries or requirements on having to sort of maintain a certain modicum of, of, you know, your, your, your stature that, that make it so you wouldn't, would you present this differently if you weren't all of the things that you are? Well, you know, if you're a psychiatrist and it's a whole big thing, do you want your patients knowing that you like to stick your fingers into the popcorn? Which, you know, it's, 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 you can't do that. And, right. and, your, and your cat and your dog and your, you know, you, you got to maintain some kind of a boundary there. A few people don't, but uh, it's kind of icky um, if people, um, that they can't be the same with you if they know too much about your personal life. And so most psychiatrists, I think very sensibly, just keep a little boundary there. Um, as for websites, hey, if you're an academic and a professional, um, in general, it's fun to put stuff up there that you're really working on and thinking about. It's interesting the whole concept of you know the, the the boundary that you have to create so that you can help somebody work through their boundaries I guess yeah becomes I mean, a, you could put it that way yeah nobody goes to a dentist with bad teeth right <laughs> nobody wants to think that their psychiatrist has their own problems but they do well, there's another thing is putting up your own problems a few people do that but that too it, it gets gets a little iffy doesn't it yeah although so, chris you're very transparent about any struggles that you have, even as an entrepreneur. Right. Yeah, my, my premise is almost the opposite, although I'm not, no one's coming to me for uh, mental health help, which I guess is probably one big oh, important good. reason. Is yeah. I walk into everything saying, hey, I deal with clinical depression. And uh, that's almost always like handing the business card part of the conversation because I want people to know it's a yes and, not some kind of a weird stopgap. I want right. to go backwards a little bit. This is humorous given the concept, but evolutionary medicine and Darwinian medicine I want to go backwards to see about how did this come about and what made you think, well, this is what people aren't figuring out yet. They didn't quite understand this yet. Yeah, you know, being a psychiatrist, I think is just about the greatest profession there is because you really do get to help people. Um, people. My friends say, oh, why are you going into psychiatry? Don't you really want to do something more practical like cut on people? I said, no. Um, and I found it so satisfying because if you have enough time, as I did in my job, to actually sit down and talk with people, sometimes over weeks or months, almost everybody uh, can be helped. On the other hand, it's a frustrating field because everybody got some different idea about what's going on. Some people say you got a brand disease. Other people say, you know, it was your early experience with your mother. Other people say it's your marriage. Other people say, you know, you don't have enough faith. Other people, you know, it's all kinds of different things. And I got very frustrated with that. Um, so I, I started hanging out with biologists and it was just this revelation. They said, well, don't all psychiatrists study evolutionary biology? I said, well, no. And they said, well, they should, because all of us who study behavior, we all study, and we, we try to figure out why animals do what they do from an evolutionary reason. You should get into this. And I suddenly realized that my whole super duper education had left this giant gap, you know? Um, and I started asking these new questions. I mean, I, before I got into evolution and psychiatry, I had to figure out about evolution and medicine in general. And here's something everybody's interested in. Well, I mean, why isn't the body better, really? I mean, why do we have wisdom teeth? Thank you very much. Um, no, thank you. Appendix? 
And then for women, that birth canal is just too narrow. You know, it <laughs> it should be much wider. I or, mean, it makes or, sense if the guy wants to have multiple wives during the course of his life, because you there's, know, there's another idea, a chance right? Chance at trading up. Yeah, right. Well, that keeps it's happening these days, isn't it? Um, but the, but we started asking a new question. That's the key to everything here. Um, instead of asking why one person gets sick, we started asking. Hey, why do we all have bodies and minds that are so vulnerable? So it's like this big switch. I mean, all my education before was from a, a mechanic's point of view. It was like, eh, how does it work? What's broken? How to fix it? And, and these biologists taught me to ask this whole other question about, so why is there a narrow birth canal? And then I took this right to psychiatry and started asking myself, yeah, so why do emotions exist at all? Instead of why some people get depressed. And from there on, it's been just fabulous growth and everybody's interested and it's turning out to be practically useful also. There is such a depth to when you start looking up evolutionary medicine. As I was doing a little bit of prep for this, I was thinking, this is, this is not, you know, so tell me about your mother. Like you can really, you can sum up Freud in a couple of sentences. You can't with evolutionary medicine. There's so much to this and it sort of feels, uh, there's a, there's a great amount of academia required to even sort of parse the way you're coming at it. How do you put the face on that when there's just someone in the in, on the couch or whatever? How do you how do you, you know, take you're all that? Talking about, about evolutionary medicine and evolutionary psychiatry. Let's do evolutionary medicine for just a second. Sure. And we're right in the middle of a damn virus that's evolving, and trying to predict how it's going to evolve is like the biggest question for our species right now. Is it going to evolve? to get milder because the milder ones spread faster? Or is it gonna to evolve to get nastier and kill more people because it spreads faster that way? We don't know the answer to that. We do know it's evolving and we're hoping it keeps that same spike protein right there just the same because that's what our vaccines go after. Um, but talk about something that's really, really practical. Another practical Im implication of evolutionary medicine is cancer. And so why the heck do we get cancer at all? Why didn't our, why aren't our bodies better protected? Um, and the answer is our bodies are very well protected. We have all these mechanisms for detecting cells that start going out of control and knocking them off. And as long as those things work well enough, we're okay. But one guy down in Florida, a fellow named Robert Gatenby, has started thinking more deeply evolutionarily about this. And he's realizing that you know, the cells that surround cancer cells help to inhibit them. And so if you just blast it with maximum dose chemotherapy as if you're trying to kill off the enemy, um, that might open up the ecosystem for those bad cells, the worst cells to grow faster yet. Because what's going on in the tumor is different cells in the tumor are competing with each other to grow faster. And he started experimenting with different strategies for chemotherapy where he's finding that lower doses lead to better outcomes to say nothing of, and this is so exciting to me that, that these fundamental basic science ideas that started off as just, hey, let's ask a different question. Let's ask you know, why we get cancer at all instead of why some people get cancer. And now it's turned into a different strategy for chemotherapy that might make, I mean, it's so exciting. We can go on to evolutionary psychiatry quick if you want to, but it well, just- Chip thinks through. we're all in a simulation. That's okay. <laughs> Chip thinks we're all in a simulation. He says the reason for all these things is we're inside a giant video game and some teenage gamer somewhere is making the decisions. That's a terrifying thought, right? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh no. I do want to talk about the idea behind the, the premise of the book. I, I, I think that uh, you know the book, Good Reasons for Bad Feelings, just the title alone piqued my interest because, you know, I'm only just starting to come along with the concept of, you know, how certain chemicals can impact depression and all that. And this is a, this is a whole other thing. So, uh, you know, one doctor, let me get on the couch. Um, <laughs> when I went through all the basic SSRIs, I, I hated all of them. None of them worked especially well for me. And they also took away my sex drive, which I thought I'm not choosing to be a human if I don't get a sex drive with this. Yep, so forget yep, that. Yep. Um, and then my, uh, my doctor said to me, hey, do you want to try something experimental? And I thought, who wouldn't? And uh, I had uh, uh, ketamine. I, blank I blanked on the name for a minute. I had ketamine yeah, treatment. Right. Ridiculously, ridiculously effective for me. Uh, one treatment, you. 11 months. I went 11 oh, months without, without a massive uh, depression issue for 11 whole months. And 
when I felt the depression coming on, whether or not this is psychosomatic, you don't have to correct me. I'm, I'll believe it's true. Um, I felt this sort of tingly feeling, almost as if residual chemicals were saying to me, I got this. Don't worry. This isn't a big deal anymore. We got this from that one treatment. So I want to talk about, I want to give you that first to say, that's kind of how I'm dealing. Right. Your, your book has a whole other storyline. Your book says we could, we could look at this a whole other way. You want to talk about that? Yeah. Um, when I first got into this business, I looked in my thousand page psychiatry textbook and said, but hey, why are emotions there? And it was like one half page. So I spent a year just reading about emotions and finally came to a really simple conclusion uh, that emotions are there because individuals who went into a special state in some special situation had a big advantage. You know, if, if you smell lion's breath on your shoulder, you know, and, and you experience nothing, uh, you're gone. Right. But if, but if you have this, oh, my God, I'm getting out of here um, and your heart starts pounding and you start breathing fast and you run as fast as you can. You know, that's called a panic attack. And a panic attack in that situation is a really, really good thing. I think for most people, it's really easy to see how anxiety is useful. So maybe since we don't have much time, we should just go right to depression. And I don't even use that word much because when, when I say depression, everybody means like depression is like you're really sick. It's really bad. Uh, so I use low mood to mean feeling kind of like you're depressed, but who knows if it's normal or abnormal, you know? And the question is, are there, the, are there any situations in which it's best not to be all perky and optimistic? Are there any situations we encounter in life when it's really better to just hunker down? And, and before I answer that, maybe we should just go to COVID again. I mean, there are all these newspaper articles about the mental health epidemic, right? And there sure are a lot of people feeling awful, right? I mean, we can't do the things we want to do. We can't start our restaurant. We can't see our lover even half the time. I mean, it's just terrible for people. But is this like mean that everybody's sick? I, I think telling everybody that they're sick and they need treatment, what do, what do you guys think about that? I think you just kind of accidentally explained a problem I've been having with agoraphobia <laughs> and panic attacks. I don't have agoraphobia. It's not one of my free things that came with depression, but panic attacks where anxiety I get all the time. Uh, but every time I leave the house right now, I get a panic attack the minute my foot hits the, the concrete. Is that and, I right? thought, and I thought, well, that's stupid. Like what an annoying thing to have. Like I know why, uh, but now you're saying, gee, that's pretty important, probably useful. It's probably good that your body's giving you chemical symbols and say, maybe go back in the house. Uh, but that's Is that it. why? Like, I'm thinking about that. So from an evolutionary standpoint, do we still have holdover things that are like, if you go outside right now, you like there's a two to four percent chance you'll die. So let's not. Like, is yeah, that right. what's happening? Right. You know, we, we aren't very realistic, are we, about what's dangerous and what's not. Sometimes we are like, um, I'm too scared. I mean, I, I'm too scared and I don't know why. The rest of the time, people are going around and hugging people without masks and, you know, really risking their lives. So how can we make sense out of that? One of the best ideas I've ever had is called the smoke detector principle. And here it goes. I mean, we all put up with smoke detectors, right, that go off when we make toast or tea. And we put up with them because the cost of that is annoying. <clears throat> and the cost of not having a smoke detector that's sensitive is death. But that, that's not going to happen very often. So I started asking myself, I mean, I saw thousands of patients with panic disorder. That was my specialty at the University of Michigan. We started one of the first anxiety disorders clinics. We got really good at treating people with anxiety disorders and panic. But I started asking myself, well, how come these people keep having panic disorder when they know perfectly well it's safe? to go to the grocery store. And, and I finally realized that the cost of having a panic attack is like 100 calories and a lot of pain, but man, of evolution, it wasn't very costly. In terms of not having a panic attack, well, if, if the alternative is a lion catching you, that's like 100,000 calories. So if you use a, a bit of fancy math called signal detection theory, that's like a ratio of you know, 1,000 to 1 or something. And this means that the system is set to set off that panic attack anytime there's a one in a thousand chance that there's a lion there. And that means that 999 times out of a thousand, it's a false alarm, but it's perfectly normal. And this is such an important principle. For some of my patients, they said, oh, I get it, Dr. Nessie. 
um, I'm not going to need you anymore, now that I know this. <laughs> it was just wonderful, you know. They said, oh, so it's just a bunch of false alarms on a smoke detector? Uh, that's fabulous. So I don't know if that helps you at all, um, but it's, it's a very profound principle, and it applies not just to anxiety. It applies to pain, fever, nausea, vomiting. I mean, what do doctors do? Do they usually cure diseases? No, mostly what we do is relieve symptoms. And when we relieve symptoms, we do it by using drugs that block normal systems, right? Block normal pain, block normal nausea, block normal cough. And the question is, so why don't we kill a lot of people doing that, right? If those things are so useful. And the answer is generally, and make, I'm, this is why I'm making this all way over simple, but uh, the general answer is the smoke detector principle. So I think like we needed to be over simple. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Well, no, I'm just like, so this makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint. It's like less risky or costly to our survival as a species to overreact. That's right. Yeah. Than right. Underreact. So we could bring it to depression too, because that's what everybody's interested in. And there's this, did you know that depression rates in the United States are eight times higher than in Korea? And, and, and what the hell is going on there? And the answer is nobody really knows. This is, I think, the most important question. If we could get our rates down to those in Korea and, and other places in Southeast Asia, that would do more good than all of us therapists put together. I'm sure there's lots of theories, Dr. Nessie, you know, probably partly based on culture and putting community before yeah. self and stuff like that. that I think that's so important, Carrie. I mean, our culture is fragmented, isn't it? I mean, we move away from our families. We often don't have close friends nearby. And that's a pretty competitive culture. And there's not much of a safety net for people. I mean, people, you know, it's, you're, we're always on the edge, you know? So I think things are feel risky uh, to, to a lot of folks. But I'm on my third city, Dr. Nessie. What's that? I'm on my third city, like for a living. My family's in Massachusetts. I moved to Florida, now in Tennessee. I have my husband's family with us. But I know exactly what you're saying. It's very... And we're supposed to move to new places and make new friends. And I mean, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's hard. You know, well, what you do is you start a show and you make a bunch of new friends. <laughs> you know, if you can manage that, that is so fabulous. And, and that's great. Um, not everybody can. You Dr. Know. Nessie, it's, you know, my selfish needs to talk about depression, but I, I am curious to know how much of, all right, well, you know how there's good gut biome stuff, good bacteria, that sort of a thing. And we've, we're only yeah. just now learning so much about that, for instance. Uh, the wh What you're going after with things with depression, like, you know, maybe it's not all bad for you. Maybe, uh, does that apply to a lot of the other psychological challenges that people may or may not have? Uh, insofar as there's a lot of people wandering around figuring that they're pretty messed up. Maybe it's not such a bad deal for them to be so messed up. Is that reasonable to say or no you know sometimes i mean when you sit in a little office just with one person trying to help them it's just this wonderful feeling of being useful and and, and the like and then sometimes you look out your window and you imagine the millions of people out there who are struggling and trying to figure out what to do and how to cope and and all that kind of stuff and that's a lot of the reason why i kind of shifted from this what's wrong with this person and why do they have this problem to hey why is it you know all of us and a lot of it has to do with natural selection shaping us with a bunch of emotions that aren't necessarily shaped to be good for us. They're shaped to be good for our genes. And pr in practical terms, this means that people think about sex a lot. <laughs> um, not, only they, not only do they think about sex a lot, um, but all kinds of things that don't, I mean, the ambition we all have, or most people have, um, some of it's to do good, stable things, but some of it's to be really grandiose, you know, and to have 20 women after us and, and, and all that kind of thing, or 20 men after us. Um, where does that get us really, you know? Um, but we can't just turn it off because it's kind of built in. Um, but it's so deep to try to understand. So are these bad feelings I'm having uh, really trying to tell me um, about what I'm doing or are they trying to get me to do something that might be good for my genes? Oh, so you're supposed to have a talk with your genes. Like, maybe don't uh, date 20 different guys right now. <laughs> you know, I think if Let's I settle down. Whole perspective real easy. It is that, you know, emotions aren't just some glitch in your brain. Sometimes it's a glitch in the brain. Let's be clear about that. Absolutely. Um, but other times they're trying to tell you something. And sometimes what they're trying to tell you is good for you. And sometimes they're trying to trick you into do stuff that's good for your genes. 
So the, the real message here, both for you know patients and therapists, is to, to really be patient and try to pay attention to what those things are and not jump to any general conclusions like they're always useful or they're always useless. You know, I think it really takes time on talking with people to try to figure out, um, should I pay attention to this or should I try to ignore it? And, and but Dr. Through. Nessie, Chris and I were raised Catholic, so you just stuff those feelings. <laughs> <laughs> you don't exactly push them enough. all down. Yeah. Irish Catholic, no less. So. <laughs> it's even better. But that's quite a transition, actually, if you're no longer in the midst of that. Um, quite. Uh, is it? What's it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, I think it's interesting. I mean, we're, I'm not a practicing Catholic. I gave it up for Lent. But uh, I, I would say that it's, it is interesting. Uh, and Robert Collins brought it up, too. He said, we're becoming more and more untethered to core institutions mm. that shaped our bonds and community. I think, I think a lot of what's happened is that we're all starting to kind of look around and go, wait a minute. Why did they make it this way anyway? Why is this system? You're on to different? the question. That is just, just exactly the question. Yeah. But I think religion does a lot of people a lot of good. Sure. Um, in addition to making a lot of people feel really guilty and awful. Depends so, on the religion, Doctor Nessie, I guess, or the or the people you know in the in the building. Yeah, and and the person and who people who are involved, you know, it's just like everything else. Yeah, but most religions try to give people some set of goals in life that aren't just striving for sex and money. And I, and I think it provides a refuge. I mean, instead of just we're all trapped in this damn competition for sex and money, um, it, it gives people a sense of deeper meaning if it's working right. I think if you don't get sex and money, it's because that's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> that's religion. Well, at least you don't have to blame yourself. You know? God's will. Um, all right. I'm grabbing Tracy back. Um, hey, Tracy. Tracy had a question way back when we were talking about how the birth canal is narrow. It's like evolutionarily, why is that? Oh, I wish I had a simple answer to that, Tracy. Um, th there's big arguments about it, actually. A lot of people say that women's hips are a little bit different from men's so that they can give birth to babies. So it is wider, but they can't run as fast. And if they were able to run faster, their birth canal, canal would be narrower yet. And so it, it's a trade-off between locomotion. But then there's some other very sophisticated studies that say, no, that's not really it. It has something to do with simply babies being bigger these days. Hmm. Um, now that we all have you no know, McDonald's around the corner. Um, wow. No, my babies were huge, actually. <laughs> Nine pounds, two ounces. Short, I mean, for evolutionary medicine and evolutionary psychiatry, you don't just make up stuff. I mean, you come up with the 10 possibilities, you know, and then try to figure out how to figure out which one might be true. Chip says, let's stick with psychiatry. What you were saying, Tracy, about the challenges of setting up a, a restaurant and how people can try things out at your place. And you must meet all kinds of entrepreneurs who are just getting started and really enthusiastic and ready to go. And you must have to try to counsel them and help them. Or is that not your job? Oh, you're muted, Tracy. You muted yourself. OK, I'm, I'm unmuted now. You know, I'm no psychologist or psychiatrist, but I think people have to be ready to hear what other folks are saying. And so um, I try to be really gentle with people, especially if I know that like this isn't going to work and just give them the facts as I know them based on the information that they've given me and then allow them to go forward, whatever that looks like. And it's, you know, it can be kind of scary because then they'll come back and be like, oh, I should have listen to you because, you know, this didn't work. And again, I don't really believe in failure. I think you either win or you learn. So if it doesn't quite work out, then That's you learn. A wonderful phrase. I'm going to adopt that. Absolutely. You know, when do you learn? When are you learn? And I was going to ask you as you were talking. So my journey to entrepreneurship and, and specifically Alamo Kitchen started with my young and son, Theodore who had lots of medical issues. He was born with a heart murmur and web vocal folds. We had all these, lots of allergies. And when we were living in the States, um, we got lots of medicine and that's what they gave us. And so you know, we got lots of scopes and lots of medicine. We had an opportunity to live in Europe. And when we moved to Europe, the doctors said, all right, we're gonna give you the medicine, but we're gonna also have you change your diet. And we changed the way we ate. Like I learned to make bread and I would get up in the morning, make our bread, roast our chicken. That, and that would be what we would eat. Right. And right. in Europe, they don't have 
fast food like we have it here. Like we, we were living in Brussels and they just don't have it the way we have it here. And we changed his diet. We changed everyone's diet and he got better, right? Exactly. He really got better. And so I really believe that food is medicine. And part of the reason that I started Alamo Kitchens was I, I always wanted to come back and teach people about food and how that really drives our body and, and our health. Um, so the idea is that these people in the kitchen will then help me do that. But I wanted to ask you, as we talk about people's moods and anxiety and, and you know paranoia or, or whatever it is, can food help drive that in a positive way? Have you found that at all? You know, there's one big theory about depression that a lot of it has to do with inflammation. And inflammation, of course, can be increased by the kinds of food we eat. Along with food, there's exercise. And, you know, I always told my patients, oh, I got something even better for you than any of my pills. Um, really exercise. Really, really exercise. And one, one patient was just oh, mind-blowing for me. She had had like, you know, seven different therapists before, and she had been on 13 different meds. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to leave the country like in a week for a sabbatical. And she says, what can you do? I said, oh, God, I don't know. I mean, geez, you've tried everything. Mm -hmm. um, she, and, and finally, I said, will you try anything? And she says, yeah, yeah, I'll try anything. I said, okay, here's your prescription. Every day, I want you to spend one full hour in the treadmill foot blast. And after that, spend an hour walking around outdoors. And don't stop no matter how bad you feel. I don't care how depressed you are. Keep doing it. And she says, I'll do it. And I got this wonderful note um, a couple of months later from the people in the office saying, this woman called and said she just wanted you to know that she'd tried 13 things before and she's been just fine once she started actually seriously exercising and taking care of herself. So these things are so important um, and they often don't get mentioned as much as they should. And it's hard for people. I mean, you can say exercise, but hey, here we are in COVID, here we are in freezing weather, here we are in, and we can't go to the gym. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's I, I like what you said about, you know, you can't just give people advice because it's hard to follow a lot of times. And mm -hmm. we got to sympathize with ourselves and with other people. We have to forgive ourselves, right? I'm, I'm real big on that right now. I uh, was with my brother last night and um, he were talking about, you know, he's an entrepreneur as well. And, and he was saying, you know, sometimes I just don't feel like going a hundred percent and, and hitting it. And my response was, and that's okay too. Pay attention right? to yourself, right? Every day doesn't have to be 100%. And sometimes I think our bodies, our minds just need a break. And Absolutely. that's how we feel. Imagine our ancestors at this time of year in um, some place where it's cold. I mean, the, the enthusiastic ones um, who were out saying, I don't care if it's three feet deep snow and zero <laughs> degrees out. I'm going to go find some food and kill something so we can eat something. Yeah, right. That person never came back. Those right. genes are gone. Right? <laughs> um, but, and, and the one who just kind of sat back in the cave or wherever and, and said, I don't think I'm going to find anything. I'm kind of pessimistic. Those genes st stuck around, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I don't know about, I mean, I think a whole, a huge thing for entrepreneurs is, is trying to figure out when do you quit? Um, you learn mm -hmm. something from, from failure. But I think in, when I started off in psychiatry, I encouraged all my patients, keep trying, keep trying. You can do it. Don't give up. Keep trying. Don't let it. Gradually, I learned more about life. And I realized some things are never going to work. Mm -hmm. and, and at some point for some people, quit it, giving up on something. You know, if people say there's one cause of bad depression in, in terms of life situations instead of brain chemistry, I think it's pursuing an unreachable goal but and I not think, being able to give up. But Randy, I would say don't quit, pivot. Absolutely. Pivot. Try a different strategy. Right. If this isn't working, let's pivot and, and try something new, something right. different, because eventually you'll turn and turn and turn and you'll look at the external environment, the internal, you know, everything that's going on within you, outside, what you're willing to do, what you have the skill set and the bandwidth to do. And you'll hit on something that works. So I'm not big on and that's how the system is I am big on pivot. Well, that's how the system is designed. We all, you know, when, when you feel low, you don't just stop thinking. You start thinking a lot about mm -hmm. what the hell am I going to do about this? 
Mm -hmm. And it always seems like the problem was non -solve unsolvable at first. And, and then you try to figure, hey, I got to really change something here. And I think that's a lot of what low mood is for, is to get you to make changes that are expensive and difficult and, and costly or risky and the like. Um, I and think some... we've stumbled on the new talk show duo right here. Yeah. I think you two watch the show together. Too. We're having a good time here. <laughs> uh, and I would love to keep it going, but I have time. So I have to, I have to call time on this. But it okay. is interesting to listen to this. One is to think of the fact that, you know, in regards to evolution, what is evolution but quitting a lot of times and pivoting? You know, evolution is that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work, that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people all the time, quit all the time, just don't surrender. You know, because one is different. One is, all right, this isn't the approach, but surrender is like someone made that decision for you. Mm -hmm. That's my that's my sort of slice of the pie mm -hmm. there. All right, so we have two things to do. We got to do person of the day. Uh, oh, and here's our person of the day. Kaboom! Sorry, was that a vote for Dr. <laughs> no, I was just looking at, I wanted to see what he was saying. <laughs> see, Deanna, bye. Um, no, I was just messing. But you know who I'm going to give it to just because we haven't seen her around in a minute. So I want to give it to Nancy. So all females <laughs> should be born with a zip in their abdomen. All right. It would be so convenient. I use a slide like that when I give lectures about evolution of medicine. It's, we should do it. it. Sense. Can we well, evolve the, a zipper? That's one of those things, too, that's the difference between the way uh, U.S. words and, and British words. Uh, U.S., we have a thing called a fanny pack. Over there, fanny is their kind of slang term for their front side. So she really wants a fanny pack, it turns out. <clears throat> so. <laughs> Here's our question, which is what goes in your backpack? Now, this could be something physical, like an avocado, and it could be something metaphorical, like uh, hope for the future. So uh, why don't we go with Dr. Nessie first? What kind of thing needs to go in your backpack? So like everybody else, I mean, travel is off the table now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And I, I've been having a great time thinking about things I want to put in my little backpack or suitcase and take with me on international travels, but no, I guess not. I'm just kind of prosaic and simple. I have a really, really tiny down vest. And whether you're on an airplane or whether you're in a, in a convention center in the south, um, it's just the right temperature and, and makes everything good. And it goes with my theme of adapting to what situation you're in, you know, and carrying something really tiny that helps you to adapt. Okay. Love it. All right, Tracy Shelton, what goes in your backpack? So I need... I need a lot of things, but I'm just going to go with two. I okay. need my blanket, my fleece blanket that wraps around my feet to keep me warm wherever I am. And lately I cannot go anywhere without my library access to the online library so that I can listen to books on tape. Mm -hmm. Or I guess they're not on tape, books on audio. I know. Isn't it funny how we all say those things though? <laughs> books on tape or, you know, uh, things like rewinding or that the phone is ringing, uh, <laughs> all these things that we have like that my, in our, my backup in our... car still has a tape player can't Does use it, really? it. Oh. yeah it work i still have it yep. classic yep oh my golly. <laughs> i know i know but you know the car still works and i don't i mean i hardly drive now so there's right. a whole there's a whole uh you know generation or more of people who were like into sales and whatnot that had to get all those sales tapes on tape and we all drove around listening to our you know zig ziglers or whatever in the car and all those uh, Nightingale Conant books and all that. Uh, my grandmother was not that kind of person. Uh, she she worked in a factory and she was quite happy to have that job in a factory. But I was just thinking about the fact that, you know, with, with evolution, I, I think she would have been really down with this whole concept because she would have said, what goes in your belly impacts your mood a lot as well. And so one thing that she would have put in your belly 